and hello and welcome to me here at Corrupted Quill for all your terrain needs. Yes, welcome fam. This is my first video here and I thought I would approach something near and dear to my heart. Yes, it is time for the humble hill. Have you ever been, you know, on the tabletop adventuring along, ready to scale new heights and yet you are stuck on the same plane of existence consistently? Yes, this is where I love my D&D gameplays and also wargaming where you create lovely hills that are functional, playable and durable. Now that is a trifecta that we don't see very often here. Now one of the things, you know, we see a lot of methods these days for that kind of thing. Using XPS is a very common method, chopping and changing it. But for me, I've gone back in time to one of our, well, one of my favorite products and one of the original products I used to use. Yes, that's right, it is expanded foam. <laughs> now we have all, there are a few videos around the place on how to create hills and that sort of thing. And I thought I'd take it a step further. So I've been carving these for a while, and I think once you carve these, they create a really beautiful substrate with, you know, various layers of rock, lovely details to paint, and things that look very natural on the table up top. But also, I can throw this across the room if I felt like it, and it would still stay intact. That is the kind of durable I'm looking for in this game. Well, let's get to it. Here we go. This is a finished, dried, well, hill at the moment. Looks like a giant turd, but we are going to do something much better with it. Now this is what the expanding foam looks like after it has fully cured. You see, it doesn't really sit very nicely. It does look a little bit, well, not great. But we're going to fix that. First, we want to cut all of this down so it is, you know, lying a bit flatter. We don't want too much of that bubbly area, so we will cut in at a little bit closer to the mid joint. Now, as you can see, I am trying to just go all the way around first, making our lines and trying to obviously match it up with the other side because that'll mean it will sit flat. Now once we've made our joins we want to go a bit deeper now and start actually cutting in so it goes flat entirely. Now, as you can see, the bigger these hills are, the harder they are to get flat. So you will have to get a nice long blade, obviously, and really get in there when you cut. Now, make it a bit easier. Let's just tear that off. Nice. Now you can see that's obviously not flat, but we can fix that. And there we go. Yeah, that's sitting pretty nicely at the moment. 
that we can use and that is the first step now this part you can throw this away but if you want to save everything like I do as a hoarder you might use this as you know, just a small hilled slope or as I've done before a giant mushroom top because that looks pretty neat we might do that in a later episode let's get rid of that all right now to make this playable and that is the most important part when you're making terrain we want to make things playable we're going to cut down you know a nice flat surface so miniatures can sit on it pretty well and what I like to do is just find the natural grooves that the expanded foam has actually made now you can see there's a little top here and we can see a nice bit here where it actually has done you know a little bit of a texture there and we might want to cut into that texture part just to make that first flat playing area it doesn't have to be completely flat you know you can use your own initiative here there we go. let's get rid of that little spot that looks pretty good we might dig it a little bit more but with a lot of hills we got to remember that not a lot of things will be perfect flat straight areas and we want to you know work with that a little bit like you can see now here I've made a tiny little kind of divot there where there is a bit of variation you could cut that flat but I think it looks much nicer with that little spot there and will definitely form a little feature later on now the thing I like to do is just get a good vision all the way around and with some of these spots where you can see it has created that little rounded area we might not want that but we might want to cut you know further stepping areas around it so let's just cut in and one of the things I like to do is just tear instead of cut everything sometimes tearing creates more natural spaces and let's just you know get some little ledges around here you're gonna make little small cuts you don't want any too straight areas you can see I'm just cutting around let's get rid of some of this bubbly stuff here there we go it looks like a nice little second ledge I like that but let's keep developing this space you can see as I'm cutting my blade I'm kind of like getting it in an angle and just maybe tearing that spot away cut in cut down take it away cut in cut down take it away and that creates these little nice you know little ledges where you know rock has variated in its stratus one of the things you can do is keep doing that maybe want to tear out another section because we don't like that spot now this is a messy process as you can see we don't want any too sharp edges or just anything that looks a bit unnatural sometimes we might want to go at you know instead of all these straight cuts let's go at an angle here let's find once again the variations cut down cut across tear it out that looks good you know, just cut a few more ledges out one of these things with I like with these hills is you never have to be really truly you know perfect in your cuts imperfection is what we want here we want things to look you know different and unnatural because those kind of things are more natural right you can see this little bit here let's continue to cut along where that expanded foam line has formed you can see there's a few bubble ranges and I like to cut around those use those as my guide of course sometimes with the expanded foam and this is what I like it shows you where the mountain hills are going to be where those ledges are going to be and where those form it's kind of naturally happened and that's why I kind of like to use it so you can see the bubble has formed along here so you know let's use that let's cut in there cut a little bit more out and that looks like it might be a nice sharp edge so let's go in a little bit further create like a nice little sharp overhang there Ooh, I like that see that I, I like that that looks nice some of these bumpy textures when they're actually painted up we don't have to be too careful with them we might want to create a few variations around there where rock has you know chipped and fallen and taken itself apart you know different little cuts sideways downways all that kind of stuff but because it has a nice little bumpy texture it actually looks all right when it's painted up as long as you've got a bit of variation there now you can see we've done about half of this hill so far we'll leave that we'll, we'll glue that back together 
that's why when you're cutting the bottom part, if you do a couple off cuts, it doesn't matter too much. Don't worry about it. We can fix that later. Let's keep working on this front area. Here we're just cutting out little sections. Do a little cut up, a little cut down, take it off. A little cut up, a little cut down, take it off. Now I don't like this spot here, so we're going to cut that out entirely. That's better. I like that. Now you can see we've got a few nice spots already. You know, you've got a few staging pots if you want to play you know, d d Hills or Wargaming. You've got places to put your miniatures at different levels, and that's what I like in playability. I can put a miniature here. Let's see what we've got. Don't have too many around. Let's put Mr. Painted Dog. You can see he fits on there nicely. I like that. He can fit on the top, fit anywhere. We're going to keep working. It's working well. All right, let's... Now you can see, once again, the bubble has formed in a more of a downward kind of spiral there. Let's use that. Let's use the natural, you know, forming of this expanded foam to create more natural environments. See, I first I do my cuts, you know, a little bit upwards, and then you cut down. And we peel it back. Get your fingers in. That's the best part of this kind of stuff. All right. See, I like that. That looks nice. Not so sure on this bubby part, so let's just cut it down a little bit more. Cut a little bit off as we go. Just taking little nicks, little bits and pieces off it. We don't want it to be fully, fully intact. A few downward strokes, but not too many. A few variations there. Now with Wargaming, I've noticed one thing people love to do is just do those square like cuts all the way up and down the moulds and that can look good but to make it look better than just a straight unnatural cliff we need to put a few you know sideways ones a few upwards ones let's do a sideways one there a couple more little variations in the stone and that makes it look much better one of the things I've learnt when you know kind of carving these things especially with wargaming, is we use a lot of bark in our processes. And bark, when it's painted up like stone, actually looks quite natural. We want to kind of emulate those, you know, those small, sharp cuts to create little variations and ledges. And that looks great in a bigger model. We don't need to use bark on this because we're, you know, we're carving our own details, but you can. And that looks good too. So this, I don't like that, it hasn't formed very well, but we're still going to use this edge here, this top kind of section. But we're just going to take out and make several of these rounded bubbled edges. We're going to make them more flat. Both for playability, but also because rocks don't really have bubbles in them. Well, some do, but not this one. There we go. That looks nice. Little sharp edges there. Now, if you want to, yeah, variations are good again. We might want to cut really far in there and then, once again, make a nice little ledge there. See? Variation. Very good. Following the bubble line again, we can see how it has created that natural little, you know, variation here where it comes up, goes back in again, comes up again. And we're going to use that as our cutting lines because it's kind of done it itself. That's this kind of natural randomness we like in things. That always looks much better than the flat and the straight. So we continue... Let's keep cutting along here, pulling out sections with our knife, with our fingers. There we go. I pull in, I pull it up, and we take out a little section. Easy as with a nice sharp knife. There we go. I like that. That actually is looking quite good already. Look at all those different shapes in there now. Didn't take us too much time. We didn't have to worry about too much. We didn't have perfection. We just, you know, used the natural shape that we were given to create a lovely, simple hill. Now, it doesn't look like much now, but we're going to keep going with some other processes right in a minute. I don't like that. That's out. Done.
All right, so here we go with the second stage now. We have it all cut, leveled. It's looking good. What we need now is our old faithful in the terrain business, Sculptor Mold. Now, I don't exactly use Sculptor Mold because it's very expensive to get shipped here to Australia and you don't get very large quantities. So as with most things in terrain, there is always an alternative if you look hard enough. And one of the things I found was called Modeling Mix. It's kind of used for art students to crown of, you know, paper mache crafts and that sort of stuff. And you get it in huge bulk quantities and it is kind of very similar in consistency. A little bit finer, but that's okay. One thing I found is it doesn't cure as hard as Sculpt Mold does, but that's where we add our handy handy dandy plaster. Now I do go for cornice adhesive, it seems to be one of the, you know, a bit more, um, create a bit better effect than regular plaster of Paris, so we'll add, a, you know, just a tad of that. Basically for every cup I add maybe a couple of tablespoons worth, and that seems to, you know, bulk enough enough to matter. So there we go, we've got a little bit of a mix in there. I always add a little bit of PVA, just on the safe side, I don't know if it actually helps, but that's what I do. Oh, we have to open that. It always helps to make, you know, fail safes, just if something doesn't work properly. All right, now let's not worry about measuring the next part, which is water. I like to kind of feel it out. I know that's a bit silly, but one of those things you kind of find once you're in the craft long enough, is you know the kind of amount that goes into it. Now let's get this all stirred up and ready. All right, that looks pretty good. Yep, that was actually the exact amount of water I needed. Go figure. All right, let's get rid of that. Now, what we're going to do with this is, now, if you're okay with having a few holes and that kind of thing, maybe it's, you know, lava train or something like that, you know, volcanic material where it has those kind of bubbles, that would be okay. But we're not going for that here, so we're probably going to smooth all of these out. All right, let's get our hands dirty. All right, putting it in. I like to first just smooth down the top layer, make it, you know, a good little space for playable material. Also working your way into some of those edges so it forms nice and hard around there. Let's get down on this ledge as well. Now you don't actually need that much sculptor mold for this kind of thing. You're just kind of trying to, you know, fill up the basic flat edges where you've created those little tiny holes that are showing through at the moment. It's all you need to do, just the thinnest of layers along there. And what this also does is some of the, you know, the rougher edges that come out of the cutting process don't look as good if you paint them up as is, but this creates a bit more of a, a tougher exterior there, which actually looks a lot better. So you can see as I'm doing, I'm using my fingers to kind of smooth into those little gaps. All right. That is looking mighty fine, I must say. Let's smooth in this area, anywhere that it looks a bit bubbly. We want to get rid of that. Alright, I made a lot more sculpting mold than I thought. That is okay. Alright. We're just working our way into all those grooves we cut earlier. Going around in a circle, seeing how we can smooth it out. You see any like, kind of popping up everywhere? We use that, smooth it down again, keep working our way along. Now I probably used about a cup of sculptor mold then to kind of make all my modeling mix anyway to make that and I've still got some left. So you can see you probably don't need as much to do this process. You could just work it in small gaps and you know, do it as you go. Oh, we missed a spot over here. Let's get that. All right, I like it. Now one thing I like to do if I do have a little bit extra, you bring it out you get, you know, a little bit of baking paper or something similar, waxed paper, and you can create little, like, you know, rocks that actually look quite good once they're dried with this kind of stuff. You know, sometimes it's good to have a little scatter bits of train. I'm going to pop it over here for later. Boop. 
All right, that looks great. Now, one thing we can do to even, you know, pop this up to the next level is add, you know, some other bits and pieces like rocks, maybe some bark around little edges to create, you know, different variations. I'm going to keep this one pretty simple, but you can add those kind of things at this stage to really, you know, bring things ahead. All right, I'm going to place a nice little big old rock over here and maybe a big old rock over there. Yeah, that seems enough big rocks. We're going to add all the smaller details, rocks, grass, all that kind of later, but it's kind of good to get this bigger rocks glued in at this stage, I find. All right. And I'll pop one over here. That looks good. Now, one thing I might need to do or might want to do, that will look great by itself there. You know what I mean? It is looks like it's broken apart, fallen down a little bit. I can deal with that, but grab a little bit of this sculptor model, and I'm actually going to make it as part of that cliff edge there and just work it in. See, I've got a little bit of a, a nice little rock face there, and that's another way to create some great detail on these pieces. Now, if we've got small little rock pieces, I could even, you know, put some along on different edges and work it like that. But I think that is enough for now. Now, we do have to wait at least, you know, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes for this modeling compound to dry. Sometimes a bit longer if it's a bit wetter. But once it does, it'll create a nice hard edge all along the top, which is great to use later on. And then we'll get to painting. Thanks, and we will get back for the next part. And here we go, completed and painted now. I didn't think I'd show you the undercoating side because that part's, you know, pretty much the same wherever you are. Use the, you know, black magic craft method where you get a whole heap of Mod Podge and, you know, craft paint, cover your in whatever you know flavor you feel like and go from there for me i'm a bit of a cheapskate <laughs> and i go the bulk method for bulk crafting house paint now this creates a really good layer it is a latex so it's not washable and if you you know scrounge around the mist tints aisle like i do every single week you usually find some good colors there and about half price so well worth the trip that's what I did. I have a nice dark grey. And of course I have a few other colours like tans and browns, but you know it can take you a while to kind of get the best ones for you. So here we go. Undercoated painting. You can see it's got a little bit of texture now from the you know uh, modelling mix we put on before. But this is the fun part because now it's going to start looking, you know, a little bit more like a functioning hill. Now before we put anything, you know, flockwise on it. We are going to, you know, detail paint this a little bit more. Get it, you know, ready for whatever else we want to do. And here we go. Now we're going to get ready for the next stage. I've got a range of colours. I've got my cup of tea. I've got paper towels. And we're not necessarily going to be dry brushing. It's more going to be wet brushing. So getting most of the paint off, but still enough to let it, you know, little bits and pieces mix together. Creates a more natural appeal in my look. So of course we've got black, let's chuck some in our mixing pot, lots of white, Boop. and a little bit of green and red. Red is rather nice. Well maybe I could have got a brown instead. Mm, decisions, decisions. We've got green and brown so both of them make a nice, oh we've got green and red. They'll make a decent bit of brown. All right, here we go. That'll be my mixing palette. Now that's, I'm a bit of a hoarder, so whenever I buy a blister pack of miniatures, I always keep plastic. Comes in handy. Let's get mixing. A little bit of black, a little bit of white. Let's get a lot first, because we're going to, you know, dry brush the whole lot. A wet brush, whatever we're doing. There we go. That looks good. There's our paper towel. I just took a little bit off. Yeah, we're just going to get this whole thing at this stage. Now we're going to leave a little bit of the, you know, inner recesses around, because I like that. It creates a bit more depth in how you build and how you paint. So as you see, I'm just, you know, running over the whole hill. Now this is why I like kind of an undercoat in, you know, a base colour that your hill's going to be. 
not necessarily black because black's a bit harsh sometimes so I tend to go like a you know a mid gray a bit harsh for me anyway some people like a you know a deeper hill so there we go everything's got a bit of that in it now and let's add some green now the green on these kind of hills because it makes it look you know a little bit you know mossy in areas which is kind of cool and because we're putting it onto already wet paint it's going to start blending a little bit as well and we like those words we definitely like the word blending a little bit of red in there see now it's going a bit brown put it over here so you can see there you go a bit brown in there all right and I'm going to focus a bit of the brown on top because we're going to be adding, you know, other colours to that. Or other, you know, flocks and dirts and that kind of thing. So that will help, you know, look a bit richer on top. There we go. Add a bit around the sides. Let's get a bit more green in that. Maybe a bit more black, actually. Let's mute it down a little bit. There we go, that's blending. Now we're blending with style. There we go, a bit of red. Makes it go brown again. Let's get around these edges. That's where the dirt's going to fill in. There we go, that looks a pretty good base mix so far. But now let's you know, do a proper dry brush. Let's get this color really down. And I'm going to take off most of this now. We've done a bit of our wet blending. It's time to go much lighter. And just be a bit more focused. So I'm quite light in my touches. I don't just drag at this stage. I want to hit, you know, the highlights. I like that a lot. There we go. Okay, those highlights are really bringing out all those carved in edges now. You can really see, and especially the rock that we put in there. You can see how that really picks up all the carved parts. Turns it from a lump of poo at this stage to something resembling a hill. There we go. Now, because we're still doing it with a little bit of wet paint on our palette, it is continuing to blend. And that's great. I like the kind of blended style. It really makes colours mix in together. Like you see there, it's a little bit more green there, but up here it's a little bit more red. I kind of like that. There we go. Picking up those edges still. And maybe on this rock. Although that's a bit too white now. Let's blend you in a little bit with a bit of brown. And using our finger. <laughs> there we go. A bit of black, a bit of brown. Perfect. That's it. Don't be afraid to get messy sometimes. Sometimes the finger, your best wet blending tool. There we go. I like it. Let's hit this up edge. Now getting to the next stage after this, I'm probably going to wait for the paint to dry because we've done our colour mixing. Yeah, let's keep going with a little bit of browns and reds. I need a bit more colour around here. Now after this does dry, then we can hit it with maybe another sharper highlight. Maybe not, it just depends how you feel once it's dried. But definitely probably a black wash. Black and brown, you know, something around that mix. Alright, oh, I found a spot I missed with my paint, so put some black in there. That solves all of life's problems. Yeah, I like that. Now you don't have to be perfect at this stage. We're still just, you know, playing with it, being a bit freeform. Because at this stage, you know, you've got a bare bit of dirt, bare bit of stone. Once we start adding the dirt and flock, that's where it really comes alive. So don't worry too much at this stage. There we go. 
Beep, 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 beep. Perfect. All right. That leaves us for the painted stage. And now we've got to wait for it to dry. All right, and we're back with a, you know, mostly dry hill, I think. <laughs> so you can see as the colors have dried, that is some lovely rock texture. Very nice base to work off. All right, I've got an array of products over here that we're going to be decorating with. Firstly, let's give this thing a black wash. Now I have followed various tutorials to make your own black wash. You can find them in, you know, your standard hobby videos like Back Magic Craft and all that kind of stuff. Good stuff and a lot cheaper. I probably have to mix this first. There we go. Get in there. All right. Now mine turns out, I like it a bit more of a dark gray. It just, that's kind of what works for me. Now I have bought this product. I love this as a brown for terrain. Watered down a little bit. It is amazing and it is very cheap. Well, you know. 20 bucks, 15 bucks maybe for a bottle. That's an Australian dollar euros. So there we go. Put a bit of brown in there, a dollop. Let's get our terrain brush back. There we go. Let's check this first. It might need to be watered down a little bit. Yep, I like that. Actually, I think it needs a little bit more brown first. Mm. Now, a lot of this kind of stuff is, you know, a lot of personal preference, a lot of you know, mixing as you go to see how you like things. Okay, that that I like, but I need a tiny bit of more water. It's a bit thick. It's going by eye to how we like things generally. And it's not something I can really like tell over a thing, like, you know, add a tablespoon of this to a teaspoon of that. It's just something you have to go through <laughs> and make yourself and just figure out how you like things. So I'm going to dollop this mainly around a lot of these crevices, the inner areas and the inner workings of our hill, just so it really gets in there. All right, look at that. Up the top as well. In the little spots. Let's get some shadows. Now, I haven't done it before, but apparently oil paints are amazing as well. Now, probably for terrain, you know, a bit of white spirits, a bit of oil paint. I see it a lot on terrain work, and I think it would be, you know, a very cost-effective way of doing this kind of stuff. But I'm a bit put off by the smell, because that is some harmful fumes. All right, look at that. Now, of course, I did make way too much of that dip. It's still all in there, but we're just going to give it a pat just to take off the top areas and create more of that shadow. Oh, look at that. I love it. I love it already. Oh, that really brought it out. I like that. Okay. Now, let's wash our brush. We'll keep using that for today. Blip, 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 blip. All right. And now, I am going to get another one of those little trays that I use constantly. And we're going to get some glue and we're going to go at this. Squish. Now I have got a lot of stuff over here. I got some rocks. I'll probably be putting these on first. Now, because I make a lot of terrain, I bought basically a whole bag of road base and spent an entire afternoon sifting it down into similar grades. Some of it being finer, some of it being at larger, all that kind of stuff. And well, I still have half a bag of it. <laughs> The other thing I'm using is a little mix here. Now this is my general dirt base. It's a little bit of sand, a little bit of um, you know dirt that I've dried out in the oven. Also a little bit of a lot of um, dry coloured grout. Now mostly it is this brown colour. That's the colour I picked for my dirt. But you can get a lot of other coloured grouts in any particular style you feel like. And that makes a really nice base for your terrain because it is a lot finer. It looks a lot better as dirt and also it creates a really hard layer once it's all finished and of course lots of flocks that I've spent a while collecting and we've got some little you know static grasses here so let's go to town now where I like to start is generally with the larger rocks so I'm going to kind of 
put them more around those, you know, fallen and broken areas. But we're actually going to glue most of this at the moment. I do want to still have maybe a little bit of this rock showing in various areas around the place. Like, we don't have to be too fastidious with how well we glue layer this, because we've got a lovely rock layer here. We don't want to show, you know, cover it all up. You know, just in a few areas where you feel like rocks and dirt are going to accumulate, flatter areas and some slopes. We don't want to discriminate here on slopes. All right, there we go. Boop, boop. And it might get a little bit coloured with the, you know, the dip we put on. So usually I do wait until that has completely dried before I worry about anything else. But, you know, time is of the essence in this case. All right, let's go a little bit around this larger rock. You can have some debris. All right, that looks good. Yeah, we'll cover that slope. Why not? All right, that looks good. And over here. I'm missing a few areas because I'm not spinning it. There we go. And down there. And there. And there, and there, and there. Good. All right, let's get rid of that. Let's put that in our water pot. And let's get the bigger rocks first. Now, as I said, around the spots where, you know, things look like they've fallen over. Around our big rock, because that looks like it, you know, broke apart. And around in anywhere else we feel like it. Let's just sprinkle. I like to clump these a little bit too. All right, little rocks are in, and now let's cover it with a bit of our dirt. Now you can use the old spoon and sprinkle approach, which is great, but you might want to get in there with your fingers sometimes too. There we go, we're gonna have to cover the whole thing. And you can see I am you know, doing a little bit of overspray here. It's not exactly hitting the glue in some areas, but you know, who cares? <laughs> we'll just make a mess and live with it. And mostly a lot of the, you know, random bits around the places will get glued down later on. Oh, I like it. There we go, around here. And in there. Actually, you, hmm. I feel like just here needs some more bigger rocks. There we go. I like it. And then a sprinkle over the top. Perfect. All right. I like that. Now let's get our flocks. Starting with the clumpier variety. Mm. Now this is a nice green. And let's let's just find where we've missed a little bit. You know, it can still hang. It might be a vine hanging there, or it might be a bush. And we're going to tap it in a little bit so it does hit the glue we just put down before. Tap it through. Tappy, tappy, tappy. And down there. And I feel like there would be some in here because it looks like a nice little secluded area where the water would, you know, flow down where plants would like. And, you know, just a little sprinkle too, a little sprinkle. There we go. And over this side and there. And I think maybe around this rock. There we go. We're squeezing it in putting in our lovely flock. Beautiful. Okay. Next one. A nice darker green. Now we did a better coverage with our grout mix before because we wanted to create a good dirt layer. A good layer that looks like dirt. The grass we're going to sprinkle over top, but we, you know, we want to be a bit sporadic in this. We don't want to cover the entire thing. We just want to, you know, sprinkle a little bit around where we put our bushes, leave some dirt in other areas. Just be a bit, you know, random in your going. I want to sprinkle a bit here and then go over here. Don't worry about too much where it falls. Yeah. You know, just a general kind of sprinkle coverage. You know, when you're doing a cake, you can kind of sprinkle with a little bit of icing sugar. That's what we're doing here. Although, I do like a lot of that, so maybe not for some people. There we go. Oh, we missed a spot. We cannot have that. Sacrilege. There we go. And now this one is a bit more of a brown blended turf. So we're going to add a, just a sprinkle over the top, kind of give it a little bit more, you know, color variation. So everything is not the same. 
beautiful. There we go, that's our flocks done. And now, no piece is ever finished without some static grass and or flower tufts. Now I'm going to put a little bit extra here. Hey, you get it back there, Rock. You stay in your spot. Now we might want to you know, just dip them in there before we put them in. Some of these are self-adhesive, but because we're gaming on these, we want them to really stick on effectively. So just dip and place. Dip and place. That one, hey, come back. Dip and place. And maybe one of these big ones somewhere. But it's kind of a, you know, it's a huge tuff, so I like to split these really big ones. And we'll put them, you know, up here looks very grassy. Just, yeah, squish it in. Mix it around. Mess it up a little bit. And you can go, I think a perfect spot is on this ledge. Like a small little tuft is collected there. There we go. Beautiful. Now, you know, because it's terrain, we don't want to go, you know, too hard on this. You could, you could put a lot of tufts on, and I'm not saying you can't. That is definitely a valid approach, and a good approach. But, you know, we've got to be a little bit frugal sometimes, and that's okay. Now I've got a little bit of static grass here. And, you know, you could use one of those static grass applicators, but for small bits like this, where we're not covering the whole thing in static grass, just a little bit's enough. Like, we're going to find little bits and pieces where the glue still is. And we're just going to, you know, dab it in, holding near the edge of the tuft that we've got. And that'll, you know, leave enough there that you've still created a little bit of variation. And that's what we want with these hills. We want variation. Whenever you have, you know, variation in the tufts and the grasses and the flocks you've used, that will always create a more natural approach. Now, it can be hard when you're starting out to get, you know, a good collection. And you don't have to go full giant tubs like I have. But, you know, just enough that you can put on a variety of things to create that really natural look. And I think that looks beautiful. That is a lovely, lovely hill. And a playable hill. Because we've got a few ledges around the place. We've got a nice flat top where models can go and sit and ambush. The next step, of course, is sealing it. And that is, of course, the most important step. Ugh. Now, I've followed a lot of other terrain crafters' approaches. You never have to make any of this stuff up yourself. There is always someone who's pretty much always done it for you. So I've got water with a little bit of detergent in, a couple of drops. It's called wet water. This will help soak into our flocks and grasses and, you know, everything else we've put on already. Soak it into all the grout. There we go, and you can see it has started to remove some of the lighter grout pieces, and that's fine. That gives us a lovely view of the stone underneath. That's okay. We're giving it a little shower right now. Now, after its shower, our sealant layer. Now, like others, Mod Podge, you know, about 30%. Water, the rest, maybe 40%. Very dual mildly. And, of course, a few drops of detergent, and that is your sealant layer. Now, I'm just going to give this a good soak all over now. Now, I know we have glue underneath this, and that's fine. That creates another solid layer there. We just want to, you know, create a few, you know, we want to make sure. We don't want our flock falling off mid-battle. So we're going to go around, keep soaking everything, make sure everything is nice and wet. And that will activate again with a glue layer underneath. And keep everything solid. Now, you could use glue for that, but uh, that's the one part where I'm kind of against using glue and go for the Mod Podge instead because it is a matte sealant, and that can be very useful. Sometimes I will use glue in my, you know, wetter pieces because that will create a little bit of a, you know, a mist to some of the flock you put down. Like it's still wet, like it's collecting and pooling, which is great. But you know, using it selectively. So that, I think, is our hill, all wet, with its sealant layer. And I think it is ready 
in a minute once it's dry. Two okay. cane. I can't help myself. Nothing is finished until I've like you know just played around with it a little bit. Beep, beep, beep. Get there. All right. I like it. Now it doesn't look like too much right now because everything is kind of drying. The grout that we put on, once we put on all these sealant layers, it goes much more of a, you know, a wet, muddy brown. But once it dries, it'll go back to its, you know, lighter kind of dusting, which will really pick out amongst all of these stone layers. So, well, we've got to wait for that to happen. Thanks. And I will see you when it's all dry. And welcome back again. Here is our, well, near completed hill. We've coloured... We've put our decorations on, our lovely flocks and dirt. And it's looking pretty much finished. Now, one thing I thought I'd mention is probably good to do before you seal these kind of things, but we can do it now because we didn't seal too much. We can hit some of this grout that has kind of settled in various you know, areas and flats where we didn't want it, just to showcase some of our lovely stonework. We can just, you know, wet that brush, put it around where that grout is, and that will pick it up and kind of, yeah, get rid of those areas so it does you know show a bit more of our lovely lovely greys there also i don't think we went probably hard enough on our dry brushing before you know when you're wet brushing it's kind of hard to tell how that's going to dry exactly so i've got a little bit of you know just a pure white here i think and let's this is going to be an actual dry brush so we do want to get rid of most of the paint at this stage and this is just finalizing our hill just with a little bit of extra detail. So what I want to do is just, you know, the usual dry brushing thing, just brushing it over some of these smaller rocks as well, some of the edges. We're not going to go very hard with this. We're just getting, you know, a little bit of extra detail where we want it. I like to go in a downward approach because that kind of hits the top edge highlights. Let's get those tiny rocks as well, give them a little bit of extra love. And there we go. Now, I think that is pretty damn good for expanded foam. <laughs> we kind of look at expanded foam, that's, you know, the bad approach to making hills. But in my view, it can actually make some very good things. And being in Australia, where some of our lovely yellow foam is very hard to get, it is, you know, much more achievable. And for a lot of things like this, I actually think it makes a better approach because we're not having those really defined kind of edge layers when you're kind of stacking those heavier foams on top of each other. It all kind of melds together in the end. And with the expanded foam, they all kind of look very different. You know, you've got a lot of extra shapes there, especially with how you've, you know, poured the foam originally. You can get, you know, some really nice long pieces. You can get, you know, some heavier, harder pictures. I've even made really big ones before where I'll make you know a nice big dome first cut it and then put another one on top you know you're getting that height available with these hills too if you really feel that need so there we go one completed and lovely hill ready for wargaming get a miniature what can we what can we sit on top there we go lovely mortal troll ready to take things to town well, we'll see you next time. Hang around with me at Corrupted Quill here.